Welcome to Waterford Community Church. I'm Pastor Josh. I'm uh, happy to be back with you this Sunday. Um, it's my first Sunday back preaching, so I'm going to wish you a uh, happy new year. Thanks for joining us, uh, watching online. Unfortunately, 2021 has not really gotten off to a, a start any better than last year. As, uh, as you're all well aware, we're watching this service online. We're participating in worship online today uh, because we can't meet in person yet. Um, and so our services are going to be online um, at least until January uh, the 17th. And Lord willing, the lockdown will be lifted. Um, but if not, uh, we'll let you know how we're moving forward with these services online. Um, but unfortunately, this is what we have to endure for the next little while, and uh, I pray that we would just continue to trust God through these times, and although it's difficult, and although it's not ideal, especially for worshiping and honoring God in church, um, we're going to make the best of being able to uh, worship together online. So again, I'm glad that you're here with us as we begin this new year, and as we worship God together uh, this morning. A couple of announcements for you before we really get started this morning. Um, the first of which is that our, because of the lockdown, our online, um, or sorry, our uh, Bible studies are going to be uh, shut down as well. Um, the the normal midweek ones that would have started up next week, we're going to have to uh, postpone the uh, starting of those. And so the only thing that is going to be on is our. Um, Friday prayer meeting, which will happen um, over Zoom. Uh, again, so if you'd like to be part of that, look in your email inbox for uh, an invitation to the Zoom link to be able to participate in our prayer meeting. Um, that's going to be for this coming Friday and for the Friday after. And again, Lord willing, the lockdown will be lifted. We'll be able to be back in person for our Bible studies and prayer meeting. Um, but for the time being, those things are going to be shut down. Um, Fourthly, our business meeting is going to uh, go forward as planned on January the 27th. Um, again, if the lockdown's lifted, we'll meet in person here at the church at 7 p.m. for that business meeting. If um, the lockdown isn't lifted, however, we will try to continue on January 27th um, over Zoom, doing it digitally, um, meeting together that way, uh, because we feel we are able to be able to do the business meeting that way. And if we can do it that way and, um, and uh, work through all of the items that we have to, then that's what we'll do. So January 27th, if we have to do it over Zoom like that, please look for the agenda uh, in your inbox by email. Uh, that way you can review it and look over some of those uh, items that are going to be on the agenda. Lastly, uh, I'd encourage you to um, use our online giving resource. So you can go to our, webs, uh, our website to give online if you'd like to give your tithes and offerings that way, or else you can do an e-transfer to the church um, by using the email www, or sorry, not www, just waterfordcc06 uh, at gmail.com. Okay, that's waterfordcc06 at gmail.com. And if you email e-transfer there, it'll get to us. And uh, then as well, <laughs> um, even though we're in lockdown, we do have offering envelopes that have been made available again because it's the start of the year. Uh, so again, when we get to meet back in person, those offering envelopes are in your mailboxes here at the church. If you would like your envelopes delivered to you, please uh, email me or Wendy Winstanley and let us know that and we'll be able to deliver them to you. Okay, those are all the announcements I have for us this morning. I know that's a lot to take in. Beginning of a new year, we've got lots of uh, loose ends to tie up, even with the lockdown, even with all of these strange things that are happening to us. Um, 
we want to be encouraged that God is still in control. He loves us, and He has every single circumstance of our lives in His control. And so it's with that in mind that we go to Him this morning with worship. We quiet our hearts. We spend our time now in our homes um, worshiping God. Though we're separated, we are still together in Christ, in spirit, uh, because we worship the same God. And we trust Him. We trust Him for this whole year ahead, no matter what we face. We believe that God is for us, and we believe that He's going to grow us and teach us and guide us and give us wisdom to navigate everything that's ahead. So let's bow in a word of prayer this morning, and we'll dedicate this time, this service to the Lord. Heavenly Father, uh, we do thank you for the opportunity to worship you. As it is not as ideal as we'd like, we still thank you that we have this time that we can set aside in our day to worship, to give thanks, to praise you, to come together as your church, as your body, and glorify you, Father. You are good. All you do is good. We thank you for the sending of your son, Jesus, who was crucified for our sin. Lord, we thank you that you've given us another year. Lord, you've given us this life. We pray that we would use it to honor you, to glorify and serve you. So teach us, Lord, again in this year in 2021. Help us to see the, your will that you have for us and as a church family. And we'll trust you. We'll continue, Lord, to believe and trust that you're holding us in your hands and that you have every aspect, detail of our lives taken care of. It's under your control. So, Lord, help us to walk with faith. Help us to believe in your guidance and in your care and your hand of protection this year. And as we lift up our voices now to praise you and to honor you through uh, worship and then through the word, we pray, Lord, that it would be pleasing unto you, that our worship, Lord, would glorify you, that you'd be honored by it. You'd prepare our hearts, Lord, to hear from your word, that it would change us, that it would speak to us, Lord. And that, Father, we would hear it as your words coming into our homes, into our lives. So we thank you for all of these many things, Lord. And we do pray that you would guide us and be with us now as we worship you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus' disciples were gathered together in Jerusalem. All of a sudden... A sound came from heaven. It was like a strong rushing wind and it filled the whole house where Jesus' disciples were staying. Then tongues appeared like flames of fire and they rested on each of the disciples. The disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to speak in languages they didn't even know. Now, Jews were in Jerusalem who had come from every nation. They heard the disciples' voices in their own languages, and they were amazed. How could the men from Galilee speak so many languages? Peter stood up and said, I'll tell you what's happening. He reminded the people of something the prophet Joel had said long ago. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. I will show you wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter said, You saw the miracles, wonders, and signs God did through Jesus. Even though God planned for Jesus to die, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. But death did not keep hold of Jesus. God raised Jesus from the dead. Then Peter said, You have seen the truth. Jesus is alive. He went up to heaven to be with God the Father. Do not doubt this. Peter continued, When you killed Jesus, you killed the Messiah. The Holy Spirit convinced the people that Peter was telling the truth. What must we do to be saved, they asked. Peter told the people to repent, to turn away from their sins and to turn to God. God will forgive your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be baptized in the name of Jesus, he said. Everyone who believed Peter's message was baptized. That day, about 3,000 people joined Jesus' followers. 
They learned what Jesus' disciples taught and they met with other believers every day. They broke bread together and prayed. God kept his promise to send the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit's help, Jesus' disciples could begin their work to share the gospel with the entire world. God gives the Holy Spirit to everyone who trusts in Jesus as Lord and Savior.
as we get into God's word uh, this morning, why don't we just open up in a word of prayer? We'll ask God 
to guide us and to lead us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand this word. We pray that as we enter into this uh, new year, uh, that you would give us a confidence to know your will. Lord, that you would uh, deepen our love and appreciation and a gratitude for who you are and what you've done for us. As we study your word now, Lord, give us wisdom, give us insight, have your Holy Spirit lead and direct us, we pray. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, again, it's good to be with you this morning. Um, I had a good couple of weeks uh, off on holidays there for Christmas with the family, and we had a really good time over Christmas and a great New Year as well. Um, and I just uh, really happy to be back preaching, being able to open up God's Word again uh, for you, the church family. Uh, so thank you for being with us again this morning. We are going to start into um, a short sermon series over the course of the next three weeks, this week included, um, entitled Unchanging Truths in an Ever-Changing World. And for this sermon series, we're going to be focusing on a passage of Scripture out of 2 Thessalonians. So if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles there to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17, and then this morning in particular, we're going to be looking at verses 13 and 14. Over the last year, we faced uh, a number of great challenges um, as individuals, as a church family, as a nation, even as a world. Uh, we face many of these challenges, and unfortunately, those same challenges seem to continue into 2021, of course, as evidenced by the fact that we are currently not able to meet in person, even for this church service, even as the year begins. We continue to be faced with all of this uncertainty, the uncertainty of change from week to week, month to month. Uh, these changes affect so many different aspects and areas of our lives, um, our work, our children's schools, all of the social interactions that we would like to have and maybe used to having are changing or have changed. Our hobbies and recreation, things like this have completely changed over the last year as we near that year mark of being in the pandemic. How are we as Christians then meant to navigate this ever-changing world? A couple of weeks ago, Jason preached a great sermon on, um, on resolutions and looking at Jonathan Edwards, uh, one of his resolutions, which had to do with redeeming the time. And maybe as you begin the year, you think about resolutions, you think about how you can be committed to God afresh or in a new way or to go deeper in your faith. And I don't know about you, but for me, I got caught up in thinking over the last few weeks, God, how exactly are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to be committed to you in a deeper way? How are we supposed to make plans as individuals and as a church family if we are faced with so much uncertainty that we don't even know what the next few weeks or even month has in store for us? In other words, how can we as Christians make plans to be committed to you if we don't know what tomorrow has in store for us? Well, rather than sit back and simply be a passive participant in this coming year, I want to suggest that we continue to look for ways that we can be active in our Christian faith, because I believe the Christian is called to take an active role in serving God and looking for ways to strengthen their faith. How are we supposed to do this in this ever-changing world around us, especially in 2021? Well, I believe we do this by committing to the unchanging truths of our faith. Hence the sermon series, Unchanging Truths in an Ever-Changing World. We're going to look at three unchanging truths that the Christian can be tied to this year, can be committed to this year, given all of the change that's going on around us and all of the uncertainty around us. There are some very important unchanging truths that we can be absolutely certain of, and therefore we can be committed to afresh here in 2021. So if you do make resolutions or you are thinking about, how can I deepen my faith with God this year, I would uh, submit to you these three ways that we're going to see over the next three weeks here in 2 Thessalonians. The first one this morning is that for the Christian, the first unchanging truth is that you are chosen by God for salvation. And I want us to see this here now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 13 through 17. So the Word of God says this, But we ought always to give thanks to you, uh, to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, 
because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work. Now, as I made mention, we're going to be focusing on verses 13 and 14 this week, and we're going to look at that phrase where it says, God chose you. God chose you as first fruits to be saved. This amazing Unchanging truth is something we can take with us into 2021 as we recognize all the change that's going on around us and there's great uncertainty. How do we plan for this future? As a Christian, we can be committed to the unchanging truth that God has chosen us. This will never change despite whatever is going on around you. If you know the person of Jesus Christ and have trusted him in faith, for the forgiveness of your sins, that means that you can be assured that God, in his love, has chosen you. No matter what happens this year, no matter what struggle, trial um, you may be facing, God has chosen you. And this is a wonderful, unchanging truth that we can be founded in as we move forward this year. Chosen by God. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, chosen by God means, first of all, that you are loved by God. Look what it says in verse 13. I always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you. Chosen by God means, first and foremost, that God loves you. I remember last week how Pastor Paul gave uh, that wonderful message on John 3.16, talking about how God, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, God's choice to graciously save you is uh, predicated on the fact that he loves you. Uh, He loves you, and so therefore he's chosen you for salvation through the person of Jesus Christ. So if you've reached out in faith and trust in Jesus, if you've asked him for forgiveness of your sins since he's died on the cross for you, that means that not only has God chosen you, but he's chosen you in love. God's gracious gift of salvation is predicated on his love for you. So we know that Romans 5, 8 tells us God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, there are many worrisome things in the world around us that might cause us to doubt, in fact, that God loves us. But the message of 2 Thessalonians is meant to remind us that we should not doubt and not worry that God doesn't love us. In fact, in this um, epistle to the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul was addressing a very important matter. The matter was that the church so long ago here was being deceived, There were people going around saying things that were just simply not true of the church or not true of God. And one thing in particular that they were saying was that Jesus had already come, the day of the Lord had already happened, and that God's judgment has already come. And maybe these Christians in the church in Thessalonica, maybe they had missed the day of the Lord. As the Apostle Paul was writing 2 Thessalonians in part to assure them they hadn't missed God, they hadn't missed Jesus, he hadn't returned yet. Um, So if you look back in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, he says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or spoken word or a letter seemingly to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction." So we see that the people in the Apostle Paul's day and age, the church here in Thessalonica, they were being deceived by some. Some were trying to tell them that Christ had already returned and they should be worried that maybe they had missed him. Well, in fact, the Apostle Paul says, no, that's not the case. Don't be deceived. Don't be worried. See, God has not abandoned you. You've not missed him. He has not left you out of the plan, out of the picture, out of salvation. And that would have been the greatest worry of the people in Thessalonica. Well, if Jesus has returned, if the day of the Lord has come and we've missed it, maybe we don't really belong to him. Maybe we're not 
part of his family. Maybe he doesn't really love us. And see, there are so many worries that can come up in our world and in our day that may cause us to think, well, maybe God has abandoned us. Maybe he doesn't love us. Look what's going on in the world around us. Look at all of the difficulties and struggles that we face, the hardships that are upon us now, especially because of the pandemic. Maybe this is evidence that God doesn't love us. And unfortunately, there are some in the world today that would try to spread fear or would try to spread doubts and worry. But the word of God is meant to encourage us and remind us that God has chosen you. Therefore, he loves you. For God to choose you, that means, of course, he does love you. We might believe wrongly that God has abandoned us in a pandemic, abandoned us to loneliness, abandoned us with joblessness and hardship, but that is simply not the case. If God has chosen us, if God has chosen you as a believer, then he loves you. And this is the greatest evidence that he has not, in fact, abandoned us. So if you're a Christian, if you trust in Jesus as your Savior, then you cannot change the fact that God loves you, that his choice to save you is evidence that he loves you. And this love is completely unchanging. It can't be changed. In fact, your actions can't change the love of God for you. Neither can your circumstances because God's love is not earned, nor is it conditioned on our circumstances. It's given freely and demonstrated through the work of Jesus. If you want demonstration or reminder that God loves you, just be reminded of Christ dying for your sin on the cross. No matter what you face, no matter what actions or sin you fall into, you can be assured that God really does love you. The greatest evidence is Christ dying for you on the cross. So, my sin does not change the fact that God loves me. See, oftentimes Christians can be worried that, well, my sin and my failure, my mistakes, my hang-ups, that might be cause for God to stop loving me, but that's just simply not the case. If God's chosen you and he loves you, if you faith in Christ Jesus as your Savior, then God does not stop loving you, not ever, never. Whenever we fail, whenever we have a misstep, whenever we fall into sin, of course, the proper response is to repent and trust Christ and turn back to him faithfully, but we must never believe that falling into sin in any way is cause for God to stop loving us. But he never does that with his children. He never stops loving us because he's chosen us, because his love is based on his own free will. It's not based on your performance or your earning his love. So my sin does not change the fact that God loves me. But neither do my circumstances. And see, this is where sometimes Christians get caught up in looking at the world around them and thinking to themselves, well, what about this global pandemic that's upon us? Is this an indication, perhaps, that God doesn't love us? Look at the hardships that I have to walk through in my life. Is this an indication that God doesn't love me? Maybe I've not been able to go back to my job and I've faced joblessness. Maybe I've been alone, isolated away from people that I love. Is this an indication that God's punishing me, that he doesn't love me? So we must not believe that the circumstances around us are an indication of God's love, either greater or lesser. We must not look at the circumstances around us and think, well, if things are going well, that must mean God loves me more. Or if things are going poorly or bad, that must mean God loves me less. This is not the way God's love works. The Word of God reminds us you are chosen by God for salvation. That means you're beloved. You're loved of God no matter what circumstance you face. So in 2021, you can be constantly encouraged that God loves you. You can commit your heart and your mind to the incomprehensible truth that God's love will never depart from you. You're chosen. If you know Christ as your Savior, you are chosen by God. That is a choice that he freely entered into. That's a love that he freely and graciously give, gave you, and it will never change. So chosen by God means, firstly, that you're loved by God. Chosen by God, secondly, though, means he has graciously worked in your life. He's already graciously worked in your life, and he'll continue to graciously work in your life. So look at what it says near the end of verse 13. It says, of course, that God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Listen to how this happens, though. Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. See, 
When we are chosen by God, it means God has graciously worked in our life to bring that choice into effect. God's Spirit sanctifies us for salvation, it says. To be sanctified is to be purified, to be set apart for God, meaning the Spirit of God himself has come to us and changed us from the inside out, transformed our hearts to love and obey God. So that as we study in the book of Galatians, it says that the Spirit of God comes to us and God sends his Spirit to us, cries out, Abba, Father within us that our hearts are transformed from the inside out. But that's not the only way God has graciously worked in your life to bring salvation. He works even through your own belief and faith. The very faith that you have in Jesus, the very trust that you have in Jesus, was given and sent to you by God. God uses that belief as a means to save you. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 tells us, For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then, of course, John 3.16, which Paul Ver preached to us so powerfully last week, the end of it says, whoever believes in him, that's in Jesus, should not perish but have eternal life. So belief and faith, God uses this to bring us salvation. What is belief and faith? Well, simply put, it is to trust in God for your salvation. It's to trust specifically in the work of Jesus, that Jesus died on your behalf so that you don't have to die for your own sins because Jesus already has. In other words, he's atoned or covered your sin. And you must believe this. You must trust that this is true. And so to be chosen by God means that God has graciously worked in your life to bring you the Holy Spirit to purify and sanctify you. And he's brought you this precious belief and faith in the person of Jesus Christ. So he's already worked. He shows you that he loves you and he's chosen you for salvation. And his choice to save you, is brought into reality through the work of God's Spirit and faith in Christ Jesus. Therefore, many theologians say this, say it this way. They say salvation is made effectual. Say it again. Salvation is made effectual. That means salvation is brought into reality into your life. It's made effectual through the Holy Spirit and through your faith in Jesus. So as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Here we have the wonderful mystery of how God brings salvation to bear upon our lives. It is his divine doing. He chooses us. He loves us first. He brings his Holy Spirit to transform us, to change us, to help our hearts be able to love him and honor him. But we have to participate as well. We have to choose to have faith and have trust in him. This, of course, is even enabled and brought about by God himself as well. But this is the wonderful mystery of salvation, how God brings to bear on our lives through the Holy Spirit and through our faith, this wonderful gift of salvation. So as we remember, we walk into this uncertain time of 2021, we're reminded that God has chosen us. He's already loved us. And he has already graciously worked in your life. That means God's spirit has already changed you. And God has given you a heart of faith in Jesus. If you do, in fact, believe and trust in Jesus. This is an unchanging truth that I believe the Christian, that we as a church need to walk into this this year, 2021. Therefore, we can commit to walk faithfully with God in step with him and his spirit. Reminded about that uh, message that we had in Galatians from Galatians 5.25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. You might be thinking, well, how does knowing this truth that God has brought His Spirit to bear into my life, to speak into my life, to change me, and how does my faith and trust in Him, how does that help me commit to Him afresh in 2021? Well, I'd encourage you to think about your commitment to Him then in this way, through a prayer. And perhaps your prayer to God might go something like this in the new year. God, since you loved me and chose me, and since you've given me your spirit and a heart of faith, help me to faithfully live for you each day. Deepen my faith in you. Continue to sanctify and purify my life. Bring my heart constant repentance from sin. Inspire my mind to think on heavenly things and stir in me an unquenchable love for your presence. You see, all of this is possible because God has sent his spirit to dwell in us. 
All of this is possible because God has given us a heart of faith and belief. This is why the Apostle Paul says, God's chosen you through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. With these two things in mind, we know that God has graciously worked in us. This is an unchanging reality for the Christian, for the believer. We can go into 2021 knowing whatever we face, the Spirit of God is with us. No matter what we face, we have faith and trust in Jesus. That can and will never change. So we can pray to God and we can ask Him to deepen our faith. In 2021, we can say, God, through your spirit who dwells in me and through the faith that you've given me, help me to walk closer to you this year. Help me to be constant in repentance. Help my mind to be set on the heavenly things and stir me to have a love more and more for your presence. All of this possible because of the unchanging truth that God has chosen you and has graciously worked in your life. Well, thirdly and lastly, chosen by God means that we have an eternal destiny with God. Look what it says in verse 14. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chosen by God means that we have an eternal destiny with God. We will obtain the glory of Jesus Christ. What exactly is that? What is the glory of Jesus Christ? In fact, the Apostle Paul doesn't really talk about God's glory in this way a whole lot in the Word of God. Oftentimes, he talks about the glory of God the Father himself, but not as often does he talk about the glory of Jesus Christ. And here in 2 Thessalonians, one of the rare occasions that the glory of Jesus Christ is being emphasized, what exactly is the glory of Jesus Christ? Well, there are three things maybe that help us understand this from the Word of God. First of all, the glory of Jesus Christ has something to do with the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus. After he had died for our sins, of course, we know that three days later he rose again, and that when he ascended into heaven, he was exalted in God's presence, seated at the right hand of God. So the glory of Jesus has something to do with the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus himself. So as Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11 say, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus has something to do with his glorification. And that in turn has something to do with our resurrection because our future resurrection from the dead is referred to as a kind of glory as well. As it says in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 42 to 43, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. Speaking of our resurrection, what is sown is perishable. That's this earthly body. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised, our new body, is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So just as when Christ was risen from the dead and exalted before God, he was resurrected to glory, our resurrection from the dead has something to do with obtaining the glory of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus was glorified in being resurrected, so too will we share in that glory when we are resurrected after we die. But then lastly, the book of 2 Thessalonians actually uncovers for us maybe best what this glory of Jesus Christ really looks like. And if you look back into chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians, the glory of Jesus looks like the day of judgment and salvation when Jesus returns again. So in 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 9 through 10, the word of God says, they will suffer that's the wicked. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. 
So I want you to see what's happening here as the Apostle Paul sets up for us what it means to obtain the glory of Jesus Christ. He reminds us that when Jesus returns again one day, someday in the future, because Jesus has been resurrected and he's been exalted at the right hand of God one day, he will return, the Word of God tells us, again and again. And here in 2 Thessalonians, we hear God, or so Jesus will return and he will punish those who are wicked. They will be sent away to eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might when he comes on that day. That's a way of saying the day of the Lord when Jesus returns to us again. But when he comes on that day, not only will he judge the wicked and he'll send them away to eternal destruction, but he will save the righteous. It says on that day when he comes to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who believe. So that means we who remain, who know Jesus and trust and love him, we will see his glory and he will be glorified in us because we will have endured and trusted him to the end. And we too will have been resurrected to live with him eternally. So the, the glory of Jesus Christ or obtaining the glory of Jesus Christ is the resurrection, the return and the rule of Jesus himself. So for us as Christians to obtain this glory is to share in Christ's resurrection, to be resurrected ourselves one day, and to participate in God's eternal kingdom under the marvelous rule of Jesus our Savior. This is what it means to obtain um, the glory of Jesus Christ. Being chosen by God means that we have this destiny waiting for us with God. It means one day we will experience and live in this glory, the glory of Jesus Christ. And notice how it says we obtain this through the gospel. It says, to this he has called you, in verse 14, through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul summarizes about how, of course, God has loved and chosen us through his gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gospel means good news. Through the good news of Jesus coming to die for our sins, this is the way that God has chosen to save us. He's shown his great love uh, towards us through this wonderful gospel message that we might be saved. And then notice that phrase, so that. It says, to this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This indicates, of course, the purpose of God's gospel, the purpose of the person of Jesus Christ coming to die for our sins. The purpose is that we might know the glory of Jesus Christ. So God's purpose in saving us, God's purpose in choosing us, God's purpose in loving us is that we would experience and display his glory as his people. And this is an unchangeable truth that is going to persist with us, of course, all throughout our lives, but specifically I want us to note here in 2021. As we begin a new year with all of the uncertainty and changes that are ahead of us, we can be absolutely sure that if we trust and believe the person of Jesus Christ as our Savior, that God has chosen us for an eternal destiny with Him. He's chosen us to know and experience and participate in the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. This is an unchangeable truth that the Christian can cling to knowing this will never change. No matter what you face, no matter what hardships, no matter how tempted you might be to doubt God, you must be absolutely sure that God has destined you for his eternal glory, the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, how do we apply this to our lives, maybe more specifically now in the year 2021? Well, I'd like to put it to you this way. We can commit to the glory of the Lord in two ways. First of all, we know that God can use every single circumstance of our lives, all of our sin, our failure, turmoil, difficulty, hardship, sickness, isolation, even death, to cause me to yearn more for the glorious return of Jesus. See, as believers entering into this new year, 
We can be absolutely sure that God's destined us for this eternal glory with his son, Jesus. And, and that assurance means that no matter what we face during this year, whatever circumstance of life comes upon us, we must see it as a way for God to cause and to stir in us a yearning and a desire to be with him, that the person of Jesus Christ would return gloriously and that we would experience the glory of our, of our Savior. Let whatever you face in 2021 be a reminder that everything in this life, everything in this world falls short of God's perfect reward that he has waiting for you, an eternal destiny with him. Let everything you face, all of the, the, the frustration, the isolation, um, all of the things that remind us that this world is imperfect and broken, even your own sin, let it remind you that God has something so much better waiting for you. Let it stir in you a yearning for the return of Jesus Christ. That's the first way that we can be committed to the glory of God in the year 2021. But the second way is this. We can be committed to displaying the glory of Jesus as we walk in this life. We can ask God to help us. God, help us to display the glory of your son Jesus throughout this um, year 2021. Lord, help us to be more committed to being a representative of your son Jesus here in this life. That, Father, whatever circumstance you cause to come into our lives, whether it's, whether it's painful, whether it's comforting, whether it's joyous, or whether it's sad and sorrowful, God, use that circumstance so that I could display the glory of your son Jesus more clearly to those around us. So in those two ways, we can be committed to the glory of God this year. God, use every circumstance in my life to cause me to yearn more for the coming of Jesus. And God, use every circumstance of my life to help me display the glory of Jesus as I, as I endure in my faith. So in 2021, church, I would, I would encourage you, cling to these unchangeable truths about God. Cling to the unchangeable truth that God has chosen you, and choosing you means that he loves you, that he's worked his spirit and faith in you, and that he has destined you for the glory of Christ Jesus. I don't know what 2021 is going to bring us exactly. I've got an idea because of how the year's already begun, but we don't know what next week or the week after, the month after, or this year is going to bring makes it very difficult to plan, doesn't it, for the future? It makes it very hard for us as Christians to know, God, what exactly do you want us to do this year? Well, there are a few things that the Christian can be absolutely sure of. One of them is that God has chosen you. And because he has chosen you, that means in the year 2021, even though it may be one of the most difficult years that we have to face, we can be committed to loving God because he first loved us. We can be committed to faithfully serve God because he chose us and planted his spirit in us and gave us faith. And we can be committed to long for his glorious return because we know that's what he's destined us for as his chosen people. So these are some of the unchanging truths in an ever-changing world that I pray you're encouraged by. As a church and as an individual, that you would know the person of Jesus Christ and know his saving um, power, that you would accept him as your savior, accept the gift of God. But that more than that, as you walk this year in 2021, you would cling to these unchanging truths as the bedrock, as the foundation of your faith, knowing that these things, the fact that God has chosen you, cannot and will not change. And you can walk into this year knowing that God loves you, that he's graciously worked in you, and that you have an eternal destiny with him. Be committed to that truth this year. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would help us with our faith. Help us to believe when we're tempted in unbelief. Help us to believe when we're tempted to sin. Help us to believe when we're suffering and in pain by the circumstances around us. Help us to believe and have faith when things are good and when things are easy in life. 
Father, we pray that you would use every single circumstance to remind us that you have a great destiny, the glory of Jesus awaiting us, that you've chosen us and graciously worked the power of your spirit and faith into us, that you've chosen us because you've loved us, and that will never change, no matter what else changes in our lives. The great uncertainty of the year 2021 is upon us. We know that that will never change. You'll continue to love us. You've chosen us. You'll continue to work in us. And you'll continue to call us to that eternal destiny with you. We thank you for this truth, Father. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, church family, for joining us this week for another church service together. Although we miss meeting together in person, we are thankful that God has allowed us to worship him together this morning this way. And I'd encourage you to see you back again next week online for another church service. God bless you. Keep you safe and well and healthy this coming week.